right, so uh, uh, we have basically uh, an oversimplification I'd like to present to you guys, and don't go telling your Italian friends about this, but uh, basically I'd like to split up all of the pasta dough we can possibly make, all the different shapes we can make from pasta dough into two categories, uh, which would be like northern style, okay, so northern Italian style pasta dough, and then southern Italian pasta dough, all right? So, a lot of the reasons we do this is because of history and tradition. In the north, they typically make pasta using a lot of fresh eggs, or a lot of times an abundance of egg yolk. And they do that in combination with like white, soft flour, what they call grano tenero, uh, soft grain, or sometimes called like double zero flour, if you guys are familiar with. That's simply their Italian system of grating flour. Double zero flour being like really low protein, really low gluten, and kind of yields, in combination with fresh egg, a product that's like very supple, like really tender, you know, doesn't have a lot of chew or too much bite to it. Okay, so that's the northern style pasta dough, white flour and fresh egg. Now, the southern Italian regions we see, and I don't have any of this out yet, unfortunately, but we see flour and water pasta, okay? So typically they had access to semolina flour, which comes from durum wheat. So has anybody never heard of semolina flour before? Oh, everyone knows semolina flour? Oh, wow, okay, I'm dealing with the wrong people. Sure, I should read it. Okay, so semolina flour from Durham wheat. Uh, they sell it almost everywhere now. You can go to Whole Foods and buy it. You don't have to buy the Italian variety, although the Italian variety is usually a little finer. It's a little more refined, so it's easier to work with, okay? But semolina in combination with water, a little bit of uh, salt or maybe a touch of olive oil, and that's all you really need. And from a dough like that, we get an end product that's a little chewier, can really stand up to, you know, really hearty ragu most of the time, you know, stuff like that. Has a lot of structure, you can make some very intricate shapes. And as long as they're dried out completely, after cooking, they will hold that shape. Okay, so that's where we got like orecchiette, which you guys have eaten today, which means, oh, uh, you know, actually, I don't know if that's on the quiz. No, we'll don't, be, don't tell don't me. Don't say, okay, I, I don't know what that means, I'm not gonna tell you guys, <laughs> okay? Although I can be persuaded, okay, so just, you know. All right, so orecchiette, so we can make that. That is flour and water pasta only. In that dough recipe is a little bit of salt, and again, just a touch of olive oil, okay? So they're very simple. We can also make cavatelli, we can make uh, bussiate, all different shapes. Again, I'm not gonna give you any meaning, so don't, don't try. Okay, so anyway, so northern and southern Italian style pasta. Eggs, white flour, semolina, and water, okay? Now what I have in front of me are a bunch of fancy tools. Not all of them you need for making fresh pasta. So when people are beginning to make fresh pasta for the first time, I actually recommend the southern style pasta dough, which is the semolina with water, again, a little salt and olive oil. The reason why I recommend that is a couple reasons. Uh, one, albeit a little hard to work with, as in you have to use a lot of elbow grease to get the dough to come together, it works fairly clean, okay? So you don't have to mess around with eggs, and soft flour tends to attach itself to the egg and kind of make a paste that just gets everywhere. So if you have like a large mixing bowl, like a wide mouth mixing bowl like this, you can simply put your semolina flour in here and add water as needed to hydrate. Mix in here, and then basically knead the dough and put it together, that's all. It does take, again, just to stress that, a, a little bit of elbow grease to finish the kneading process, whereas the egg dough typically doesn't need that much, uh, for lack of a better word, manhandling, okay? So you can put that together really nicely, and as with all pasta dough, the next thing we do after we knead the dough is, does anybody know? Nothing? I thought you guys were experts. What was it? Let it rest. Let it rest, yeah, exactly. Let it rest, right? So like bread dough proofs and rises, the same processes aren't happening here. Uh, there's no bacterial growth, no carbon dioxide emissions or anything like that. But what happens is as we knead the dough, uh, we work up the gluten network, which is how the dough gets its strength okay, and durability from. And when we let it rest, and we do so by wrapping it up in plastic or putting it in a bag or a bowl on top of it, anything. And we let it rest at room temperature for like half an hour or so. What happens is those strands that make up that gluten network gently break and the dough becomes a little bit more malleable and more elastic, so easier to work with. If you make a pasta dough by hand and you've kneaded it for 10, 20 minutes, hopefully not 20 minutes, but maybe 10 minutes, okay, and you put it aside and you start to try to make pasta shapes out of it, you're gonna have a very hard time because what you have is a very firm, strong dough that's not very elastic. So if you're trying to roll it out into a sheet or a rope of some kind, it's really gonna get to where it's going as far as you can and then you're gonna let go and it's just gonna kind of revert back to where it started, right? So if you guys have ever made bread, uh, same principles there, right? Okay, so I'm letting all my dough rest and here 
if you guys can see that, I have the flour and water dough. It kind of looks like it was made into orecate, right? The orecate is a little paler in color. That's flour and water. And I have, of course, a very yellow egg dough already prepared, all right? So what I'm gonna do, actually, if you don't mind, is I'm gonna put the microphone down, and I'm just gonna give you guys kind of like a quick demonstration. I may not finish kneading it because, well, there's tablecloth on this table, but so forgive me for that. But we're just gonna put together like a quick egg dough. All right, so I'm gonna put this down for a moment. You wanna take this one? Thank you. All right, so a lot of people are familiar, maybe you've seen like videos or something like that online. Uh, you know, the, the nonne in Italy, the grandmas will basically take their flour and make what's called the fontanella, the fountain. So it's basically just like a big mound of flour on your surface. And then what you do with your hands is just gently make a well in the middle, hence fountain, right? That's another quiz, isn't it? Oh, thank God. All right. Okay, so uh, the fontanella, right? Just a big fountain. And is it? No cheese. Oh, okay. All right, all right. So you empty out uh, basically a well in the middle and you put your eggs in there. And what you're going to do with a fork is actually just first pierce the yolks of the eggs and then just mix that up. You're going to essentially just blend those as best as you can until you have like a homogenous egg mixture in the middle. Then from the inside out, start to incorporate the flour, kind of breaking the walls of your fountain, slowly incorporating the flour. Once you have a kind of a shaggy, messy mixture, uh, something that has a little bit of form, you're going to use your hands, basically get down and dirty, okay, and start pushing everything together and start kneading. Okay, so uh, I don't want to make a complete mess because we already have one in the kitchen. That's where my wife is now. I apologize, uh, but I'm going to use this mixing bowl. Okay, so as far as knowing what you need as far as ingredient, uh, we're using, of course, white flour. You can use all purpose. All purpose is fine. People think it's more or less the same as double zero, but that's actually a misconception. Uh, double zero, Italian double zero flour is actually closer to our uh, cake or pastry flour, being that it's very refined, very low in protein. So if you can't find double zero in stores, and usually you can, but if you can't, look for cake or pastry flour to use, okay? You can find it in Italy. I wasn't gonna plug my place of work, but now that you did, you went and did it, all right? Most of this stuff actually came from there, so I guess, uh. okay, so, uh, white flour. Uh, for measurement purposes, uh, I'm sorry to say that I, as well as most of the world, use metric. So at home, I have a gram scale. It's not just for drug dealers. Okay, so we have a gram scale at home. And basically what you want to look for, a really good rule of thumb as far as measurements go, is one etto, or 100 grams of flour, to one whole egg. That almost always works. Okay, if you buy jumbo extra large eggs, really doesn't make a big difference. A lot of times we find that in most eggs, it's not the size of the yolk or the fats that change, it's actually the albumin, the white. Okay, so you might have a little more hydration than you intend to, which is why my next point is it's always good to buy extra flour. So if you're following a recipe that has, says two pounds of flour or 500 grams of flour, don't buy that amount, buy a little extra. Because what we need is also what we call in the industry, fancy talk, uh, bench flour or just extra flour. And the reason we need this is to flour our surfaces, flour our pasta or pasta sheets, so they don't stick to our surfaces or to each other. Okay, so always make sure before you get started, you have extra flour on hand. Now here, I have 500 grams of white flour. So by that rule of thumb, how many eggs do I need? See if you're paying attention, five, boom. Excellent, extra points there, gold star. All right, very good. Okay, so. I can make the fontanella in this bowl as well, right? The principle is the same, but if it spills over, I really don't have to worry about it, okay? So if you don't have, you know, a clean working surface or a large working surface, just do it in a large mixing bowl, okay? So flour in here. Again, I'm just gonna hollow out, kind of make a rim, and it could go right down to the surface of whatever I'm working on, okay? So just like so. Easy enough, right? There we go, for the camera. I just realized you're filming this, sir. All right, that's okay, all right. I'll have to talk to my agent later. Okay, so anyway, so 500 grams of flour, and I'm gonna use five eggs, of course, right? So crack those in there gently. And the other thing you wanna to remember, too, is you want all of your ingredients to be room temperature, okay? So if you're making an egg dough, and that's what you plan on doing, the first thing you should do is actually take the eggs out of the refrigerator. Let them reach room temperature. Otherwise, if you're working with cold ingredient, what's gonna happen is your dough is gonna become, or your mixture is gonna become very, very firm and hard to knead, hard to work with. It's really not gonna get anywhere and you're gonna have a very difficult time. So all your ingredient, whether it's water or egg or anything like that, you wanna make sure it's room temperature or warmer, okay? And the eggs will not spoil, I promise. So first thing I do, everyday fork, this is a very fancy pasta fork. 
I'm just kidding. It's an everyday. It's an everyday fork. I promise. Okay. So you're gonna pierce the yolks in the center for the cameras. Is the money shot? There we go. Okay. I'm gonna mix that up. So basically, you just want to pick up the eggs, okay, with your fork and just kind of aerate them a little bit, beat them as best as you can. It doesn't have to be an incredibly homogeneous mixture, like a perfectly homogeneous mixture. If you can get that, that's great. Otherwise, just do the best you can to blend them, okay? So the whites with the yolks. And then eventually, when you're ready, and I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, is you're just gonna incorporate a little flour from the inside, moving outward, okay? So you just start blending in a little bit of flour at a time, okay? Now, very traditionally, people also tend to sift the flour before using it. So they'll measure it out and then sift it just to make sure there's no clumps or anything, maybe some impurities or grain beetles, God forbid, something like that. You don't have to do it, but it's helpful, okay? So I'm gonna start mixing this in. Blend that in, blend that in, blend that in. Working that in. For the flour and water dough, by the way, I kind of went through it very quickly, but it's the same process, essentially. So you have your semolina flour in the bowl and then just slowly incorporate warm water and a little bit of salt, maybe like two pinches of salt, and that's basically it. So what we have coming together here is starting to look like a bit of a sludge here, okay? And we want to incorporate more flour to dry this out. So it's less like a batter and more like a shaggy, drier mixture. So at this point, you can kind of just start breaking it up. You can move in closer if you want, it's okay. So you can kind of just start breaking this up, okay? And incorporating more and more of the flour there, all right? It will seem dry at first. It always will. But it's very important when making pasta, or any dough for that matter, that you remember, you can always add moisture, but you cannot take out. Okay, so if you think you need to hydrate this, and you can at this point with water alone, instead of whole egg, you can do so, but do so very cautiously. Okay, so add a little bit at a time. So use a small cup or something like that, and just kind of move it around. Now, when it sticks to the fork and it becomes too hard to move around anymore, break up, you then want to go in with your hands, okay? So, I have this. I'm just gonna kinda start to move this around, breaking this up as I need. Every day, making pasta dough will be a little different for you guys, okay? So if you go home and make pasta, it's a really dry day. I don't think so, and not in summer in New York. But if it is, you know, you have to compensate for that. If it's very humid, you may wanna have, you know, a little extra flour on hand, just in case you need to dry this out, okay? So I'm gonna move this around a little bit. And then I'm gonna start kneading, which more or less is just kind of using the heel of my palm and pushing in and kind of squeezing everything together a little bit, okay? Now eventually what I'll do is dump this out onto my surface. I'm sorry to say I'm not gonna do that right now, but if you have this space on your table and a firm surface to work on, then you can definitely do that. And if you think it needs any hydration, and you will know because there'll be a lot of sitting flour on the bottom. Okay, so if you're working in a bowl, you'll notice there's a lot of dry ingredients. Again, air on the side of a little bit of a drier dough, but if you're sure you need water, a good way to add it is just a drop at a time. You can actually run your hands under like a warm tap and then just use that residual moisture or my favorite method uh, is just have a spray bottle. 99 cents, not a bad investment, okay, for making pasta and just kind of spray. And this will ensure that you add as little moisture at a time as possible. Okay, so something like that. And then just move this around and kind of knead it together, all right? For sake of convenience, I'm actually gonna take this out. I don't wanna stress. I don't think anybody came here to watch me sweat over this table. So I'm gonna put this aside, actually. And on a clean surface, I just wanna show you guys how we knead. Basically, use your dominant hand and the heel of your palm, and hopefully your countertop is somewhere waist level, not down here and not up here, okay? So what we're gonna do is heel of the palm and press downward and forward, kind of flattening out the dough. And then we turn it about 45 degrees and fold it back in, okay? So this is the kneading process right here. So if you continue to do this, eventually you also get a boule or a ball of dough, all right? Bless you. Okay, so you're just gonna keep moving this around. And the ideal surface to make any pasta dough or pasta in general is something like this. This is actually just cheap wood. It's actually a shelf from a bookshelf I have at home. Okay, no kidding, yeah. So it works just fine. What you want is something that's unfinished wood grain, something that doesn't have a sealant or polyurethane or anything on it like that. That way, the raw wood grain kind of sucks up a little bit of the moisture, the surface moisture, so it doesn't stick. Uh, but also it imports a little bit, although very little, uh, texture to the surface of your pasta, which will, in the end, help it stick to sauce, okay? So you just kind of knead this, and you continue that kneading process gently, 
okay, for about five minutes or so. And at that point, we're going to do what with this? Yes, let it run. Oh, very good. You guys are paying attention. That's great. So this will eventually, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. For how long? How long do we let it rest? Generally, a little longer, usually for pasta dough. Generally around like 20 to 30 minutes is, is great. If it over rests a little bit, it may sweat more. So what happens as it rests is it doesn't just relax, but it gives up water molecules it no longer needs. So the gluten network as it breaks up and it looks like a web-like structure, will give up water molecules and the dough will literally sweat as it's wrapped up, okay? So what you don't want is on a very humid day to let it rest too long or else it may become too wet. Now, why is this important to mention also? Because if you're not sure if your dough needs more water and you don't want to risk it, because if you overhydrate, you may have to go back and start it all over again. So if you're not sure, bag it up, let it rest at room temperature, come back to it 20 minutes later, and see what the moisture is like then. At that point, you can always add more moisture and then continue the kneading process, okay? So it's important to remember that. So I'm gonna put this aside. Say again? No, 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 that's fine, just like that, yeah. Okay, so after about half an hour, your dough will look just like this. This is a different dough, I'm sorry, it won't look just like this. But it could, it could look just like this, okay? So this dough has actually been resting overnight. It's kind of a really yellow dough. There's an abundance of egg yolk here. So I mentioned that rule of thumb, about 100 grams to one egg. You don't have to follow that. There are many recipes to follow out, uh, you know, online or in books, whatever you, you know, resources you find. But if you find that you want to play around with recipes, you can always add less whole egg or some whole egg and more yolks, and then just hydrate with water. So water is always one you, what you want to continue to hydrate with at that point. Okay. So. Can you make like different things that you Ah, good question. So can you make a pasta dough, one or the other, and freeze it and keep it? Not really. Because once it comes out of the freezer and comes to temp, it kind of loses all its characteristics. So it doesn't have the same strength that you need to make pasta with. However, if you let it rest and wrap it tight, you can put it directly into the refrigerator to rest at least overnight. The only concern usually with resting pasta doughs any longer than that, even in the refrigerator, is because of the moisture available, like bread doughs will, they may ferment. Okay? So it sounds silly. But if you have a bread dough, or excuse me, a pasta dough in your fridge for more than like 24 hours, take it out to see if it's good, open it up and give it a sniff, okay? If it smells acidic or sour at all, you have sourdough, okay? Uh, it's not dangerous, it's not harmful at all, it's just sour, so it'll taste sour. So maybe some people like that, I don't know. If you can find a sauce pairing for that, hey, go for it. Okay, so I'm gonna take this uh, egg dough out now. Very gently, gently, gently. Oh boy, that's really stuck in there. It's a humid one, you guys. All right. Yeah. Doesn't want to come out. Okay, there we go. All right. So I have my pasta dough here. It's been well rested. I'm just going to clean my surface. To introduce a couple of the tools I have that I'm going to use in front of me. And again, you don't need all of these tools to make pasta. But some of them will be in that gift bag, so good luck with that, okay? Uh, bench scraper, really simple tool, but kind of a necessity. These are really cheap and easy to get. And they're just to clean your surface cut your dough, it's really kind of great to have around. If you have a non-porous surface like granite or marble at home, you really want one of these. Okay, just to scrape anything that's kind of stuck to your surface and get it off of there, all right? The other thing, good sharp chef's knife, something like that. Uh, rotella taglia pasta, literally pasta cutting wheel in Italian. This is a, a fancy one, it's like the Maserati of pasta cutters. But you don't have to get something like this, you can definitely go to any baking supply store and get a rotella, you know, for five, ten dollars. Usually you want something that's straight, like a pizza roller, and something that's fluted to make like ravioli with, or some fancy cuts, okay? So something like this. Ring mold, gnocchi board, which is definitely in that gift bag. Again, good luck, best of luck to you guys. I'm not giving away any answers. Uh, and this we roll dough on just to impart some texture, and I'll show you guys that in a little bit, okay? We have some other fancy tools around here as well. Uh, namely the dough laminator, pasta dough laminator, or sheeter, okay? Not a very pretty name, but uh, basically what we do is we invite first a friend over because you do not want to be cranking this and feeding the dough in at the same time, I promise. I'm gonna be doing it today, so forgive me if I take my time, all right? So this just clamps onto any surface, and you guys, this is a, a great investment if you get really into pasta making. As I said before, 90% of people I talk to who want to make pasta, want to make filled pasta, like ravioli or tortelli or agnolotti, something like that. To do so, you need to start with what? Nobody? This is on the quiz. I'm not, I'm, it's not on the quiz. A sheet, a sheet of pasta dough, right? What the Italians call la sfoglia, from which all filled pasta, almost all filled pasta is made. 
So in order to do that, can you roll out sfolia by hand? Yes and no. Yeah, I see you shaking your head. Have you tried it before? It's very difficult, right? The reason it's very difficult to hand roll pasta dough is namely because pasta dough is by nature a little drier than bread doughs and pastry doughs and also much stronger. Okay, so to roll a sheet that's conducive to making pasta like that, it's very difficult to do by hand. But if you invest in one of these, and I'm not plugging Italy, okay, uh, but you can buy one of these on Amazon, so the top, something like that, and if you take care of it, it'll last generations, and I really mean that. Okay, so it's a good investment there. And I brought a few for sale, they're in the back of my car. I'm just kidding, again, just joking, just I kid. All right, so first thing I wanna do is take my dough and slice it up. If I'm making a sheet with it, I wanna do something that's conducive to making that sheet. So I wanna do like a flat cross section. And I can just help flatten this out by just pressing it down or using the heel of my palm and just kinda of helping facilitate making that sheet of pasta dough. And once I have that, my main piece of dough, my mother dough, if you will, I wanna make sure it goes back into the bag where it can continue to rest and we don't want that to dry out or form a skin because then it's impossible to use, okay? So I'm gonna take this piece of dough and first thing first, we're gonna look at it and we're gonna have a feel, okay? So feel it, kind of touch it, figure out what it needs or what it wants. If it's dry, okay, you should know that right away. You should feel it feels like kind of the surface of paper or wood, not a good sign, it may need a little hydration. Uh, if it's too wet, you'll know immediately by putting it through the roller, it'll stick to the rollers, okay? So the first thing you wanna do, this has a lot of hydration, it didn't wanna come out of the bag, I don't know if you guys noticed that. I'm gonna put that down and I'm gonna do a little bit of my Fresh flour, yeah, there you go, all right. Extra points there, very good. You gave us another answer too. Okay, so, a little bit of bench flour. Just on the surface, just enough that I'm sure it won't stick to the rollers. And then as I use this laminator, or dough sheet, or whatever you wanna call it, I just wanna open it up to the largest setting. So some of these machines have numbers, some don't. We just wanna look at the opening of the, the rollers here and make sure that they're nice and wide, okay? And then basically, you're just gonna feed this through. Okay, and so what we have is like a sheet like this, like an oblong piece, okay? What we want generally, usually, is something that's more rectangular, something that has flush, clean edges. So what we can do with this is just fold it once over about a third of its length, and then the following third, sorry guys, and then the following third right over that. And once I do that, I just kind of press it down. You never want to stress your dough out, your machine, or yourself, okay? So just kind of flatten that out a little bit and then keep this at the largest opening and we're gonna feed that in there. And just make sure you catch it and bring it all the way through and that's it. So once we have this, we have to continue to feel the moisture in our pasta sheet. If it's too dry, if it's too wet, if it sticks to your fingers at all, or when you press into it, you can really make a good indentation of your fingerprint, your finger pads, then you do wanna add always a little bit of bench flour to your surface, okay? And if you're working on, again, a non-poor surface, make sure there's a little extra bench flour on your surface, okay? So when you're finished making this sheet, it doesn't stick to your surface, and it will very quickly, okay? So we're gonna pass that through. Now I'm gonna move down the way and just go gradually, kind of notch to notch. Uh, my loving wife, do you wanna give me a hand? That's uh, my sous chef and wife. My sous chef in life, I should say. Thank you, yes, yes, thank you. You have a there we go. <laughs> uh, thank you for cleaning. I appreciate that. Okay. So I'm going to move this down. Yeah. Would you mind cranking? Yeah. Okay. She gets to wash the dishes and now she gets to crank the machine. I'm very sorry for her. All right. So if you don't mind, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Huh? Go, 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 go. Very good. Very good. Now, what we always want to do also is just kind of drape the dough gently. We don't want to pierce it with the tips of our fingers. So you're going to use the pizza hold, classic pizza hold, which is knuckles up. Okay, and use your wrists and the kind of the, the you know, knuckles of, yeah, of your hand. Okay, so drape it and support the weight as you go. If your dough is a little soft, you do have to worry about going too thin. But then the next question is, how thin is thin enough? And the answer is, it depends. Okay, so it depends on what you're making. If you're making filled pasta, ravioli of any kind, you generally want your pasta sheet to be as thin as you can possibly get it. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind you want some structure so you can manipulate and seal your ravioli, of course. Uh, but when you're done doing so, you have to remember when it boils, pasta dough, like dry pasta, will swell as it picks up water. Okay, so it will always be a little thicker than it was in its raw state. Okay, so it's important to remember that as well. I'm going to move a notch down. 
And I'm going little by little, if you may. Go, go, go. Give her a hand, people, please. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yes, yes. Very good, very good, very good. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. There we go, there we go, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, she's the best. All right. There we go. So I'm not going to go too much thinner, okay, because uh, I don't have a whole lot of room. But also I want to show you guys, I don't want to waste your time, okay? So I have this big sheet here. I'm going to take half of it and reserve it. So I'm going to split this in half. Just want to gently drape one end over the other, okay, like so. And I'm just going to chop this, trim it down the end so I have two pieces, okay? Again, always support the weight of your dough. Always gentle, both hands. Don't grab at it or pierce it with your fingertips. And I'm gonna put this aside for just a moment. Okay, now I'm gonna start with this. And for those of you who have trouble seeing what's on this surface, I can't pick it up and show you, so please come in. You can come around as well. I don't mind at all, I don't mind. Please, please come around if you want. So, again, 90% of people wanna make Really? Oh, very good. That was a kind of a tricky one. Anyway, so just see if you're paying attention. 90% of people who talk to me about making pasta at home, they want to know how to make filled pasta. Can you guys see? Come on, come on, squeeze in. Yeah, don't worry about it. Come on. All right, so they want to make ravioli. Now, I don't mean to make uh, or offend anybody who's purchased or invested some money into pasta tools out there. Some of those tools are not all they're cracked up to be. So a lot of times I see people who are interested in making filled pasta will buy what's called, again, no offense, uh, the ravioli tray, which kind of looks like an ice cube tray. It doesn't really work all that well most of the time, okay? And if you do get it, you get a product that in the end is very rustic, okay? Really rustic, uh, which is not a necessarily a good thing. Okay, so I want to make sure once I have my sheet that the bottom of it, the surface of it that's actually adhering to the surface of my you know, workspace, it's not stuck. If it is starting to stick, you want to know right away so you can add a little flour and make sure it's high and dry, okay? If it's not, you're good to go. Then we want to check real quick, once again, the top side. Feel it, make sure there's some moisture there because we need this dough to stick to itself in order to seal. If it is a little dry, handy spray bottle, hold 99 cents there, good investment, okay? Or just use your fingers and a little bit of water. So just some residual moisture, you don't want to get it too wet or else it'll degrade the integrity of the pasta dough, okay? And just wet that a little bit. Now the next thing I have is my filling here. And I'm using a pastry bag, okay? You don't have to, this is a disposable one. If you have a pastry bag at home and some tips, you can definitely use it for a nice creamy filling. If you make like a braised meat filling or something that's maybe like a little firm or chunky, you can of course just spoon it out and make dollops. So what we wanna do with this pasta sheet is just make some dollops of filling, fairly small, okay? right in the center of this dough ribbon, okay? So this is a little thick. I'm gonna use the aid of my bench scrape. No, I'm not. I'm gonna use the aid of this guy right here to just kind of put the filling down, okay? And I'm going for me, and everybody's hand size is different. I'm gonna do about a finger's distance from one another, okay? Now put that aside. And what I want to do simply at this point is take this dough sheet and I want to check again for moisture. It's pretty good. And I'm going to take it from the bottom and just overlap. So I fold it in in half so all my filling is right in the fold. Now once I do that, and these are going to be tiny raviolini, is I'm going to go from one side to the other and pinch on either end. Okay? Pinch on either end. So I go above and then pinch to separate each individual agnolotto in this case, or raviolino, okay? So pinch, 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 pinch. These specific filled pasta actually has a name. These are called agnolotti del plin, or agnolotti al plin from Piemonte. And plin is the Piemontese dialect for pinch, hence the name. Beautiful, right? It all comes together, full circle, I love it. All right, so I have this here, and next thing I wanna use is my rotella taglia pasta, that's on the test. That's very difficult, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, okay, and I start from one end, and I just wanna trim the end off, and then I go up top, and just above the filling, I run all the way along and cut to separate the top trim. And now this, what am I gonna do with this? Am I gonna throw this out? No, no. no what a shame, right? Terrible. So I put this aside, and I can actually chop this up a little bit, 
dry it out with a little bench flour and put it in the fridge for later. And this is what Italians call mal tagliati. Does anybody know what that means? Po Close, poorly cut. Poor, literally poorly cut. I did not make that up. That is a real thing, okay? Poorly cut. That's how rustic they are in Italy, okay? So we're putting that aside, and we're going to serve that with a little sauce later on. We can dry those out. If you dry out your egg pasta completely, technically you can keep it out, right? Moisture, uh, or rather bacteria loves moisture. That's where mold forms and things like that, or any bacteria that's harmful to us. If you dry it out completely, you can keep it out. But even if you dry it out, I recommend just putting it in the refrigerator. It can always pick up moisture later on. Okay, so you don't want any mold to form on your beautiful pasta, okay? So I trim the end, I trimmed above the top. I'm gonna trim at the other end. And then basically I just go up the middle and cut each individual and your lotto where I made my pinch here, okay? So cut, 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 cut. And that's it, okay? There we go. You wanna eat it like this? <laughs> There's pasta right here, by the way, that I made, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so. It's just that easy, you guys, to make some filled pasta. It's almost, almost foolproof, okay? But it's, it's hard to mess up, honestly. So you can make a lot on mass, and you don't have to sweat about picking them up or forming them to any intricate shapes. If you want to down the, come on, come on. Sorry. It, no, come. <laughs> if you want to down the road, like make tortellino or something more complicated, you can always do so when you get more comfortable. But right now, if you got dinner guests coming over, keep it simple, okay? All right? So I'm gonna flour these, a little bit of bench flour just to preserve them, make sure they don't stick. And I'm gonna put those aside for now, okay? And that's my annual look they'll clean. Now with those, I can go and put those right in the freezer, okay, if I'm not gonna eat them within the next couple of days, or I can dust them very well with bench flour and put them in the refrigerator, uncovered, so they don't sweat and they can dry out a little bit, and save those for maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow night. It's all depending not on the, how dry, rather, inside of the fridge is, it's actually dependent on how wet your filling is. Okay, so if it's very wet or thin, you may want to eat them as soon as possible, okay? All right, so I'm gonna put those aside. So these I just made, the question was how long do I boil them for? If I've just made these, I can actually throw these into water right away if I have it at the ready. And in the water, these will cook two minutes. Maximum, maximum. They may cook much faster than that, depending on how thick your dough is or your dough formulation. But fresh pasta, fresh egg pasta generally will do maybe like two, three minutes in plenty of boiling water, okay? Now with my other sheet that I saved, I'm gonna take this guy and I'm gonna make something a little different. I'm gonna put this aside and I'm gonna cut this in half just for sake of ease here. Put this aside here. And the next thing I wanna show you guys to make is some cut pasta, some tagliata, okay? So we're gonna make some pasta lunga, long cut pasta. From a sheet or sfoglia, we can make tagliatelle, tagliarini, pappardelle, anything like that, or just lasagna sheets if you want, okay? So we're gonna take this and we're gonna flour with bench flour both sides really generously. Okay. Other side too, both sides. And then first thing we wanna do when looking at this sheet of pasta I have here, is we wanna first figure out what are we making and what length should it be, so how long, okay? It's all dependent on what your finished product is. If you guys are familiar, pappardelle, for instance, is a very wide strand of pasta. Don't give away Typically, oh, I didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. I thought it was the Lord. I was like, so scared. Hard though, okay. So anyway, so anyway, so we have this pasta sheet. I'm scared to know what happens if I upset him. All right, so I have this pasta sheet, and first I think about the length. Pappardelle is very wide strand. So typically, as a rule of thumb, I don't want that to be too long, because then it becomes very difficult for guests to eat or yourself, right? If it's very long and wide, it's something maybe that will require a fork and knife, which is never a good sign for pasta eating, all right? So. I'm gonna make sure I do this somewhere in the in-between, maybe like a little over a foot long, okay? Put my trim aside and save that. And next thing I do, flour this one more time, really generously on one side. And then from about an inch from the bottom, I'm gonna roll up, okay? So just fold and then continue to roll. Roll, 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 all the way up. So we have, and I'll stop there, we have like a pasta roll up, if you will, okay? Flour your surface generously. And then we're gonna use a sharp chef's knife or any kind of knife you have at home. And from the end, we're just gonna trim a little bit, save that. And then I have to figure out, I have the length set, determined already. I just wanna figure out how wide the strip is. So what am I making? If it's pappardelle, I'm gonna do something quite wide. If it's fettuccine, it's a little bit more narrow. If it's tagliatelle, it's more narrow than that. 
And if I have a very steady hand, I can maybe cut some like tagliolini or something like this. Okay, so we have pappardelle, fettuccine, tagliatelle, and maybe some like, you know, some tagliarini, something like that, okay? So, oh, I got a clap there, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, hey, all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, thank you. It, it is easy though, it is easy. One, the hard part is putting the dough together, okay, and then laminating it, honestly. Okay, so once you have a sheet, making ravioli and making cut pasta like that is actually quite simple. You don't need any fancy tools. So, so far all I've used is really this, my cutting wheel, and a sharp knife, and my extra bench flour. That's really all I need, okay? If you want to go simpler, the last thing I'm going to show you guys real quick. Is anybody getting bored? I'm not boring anybody. Huh? Oh, God. There's more pasta, by the way. I'm really pushing this stuff. Go ahead. You know, take some home, please. All right, so I'm going to clear my surface a little bit. And again, bench scraper really comes in handy. So I'm just going to kind of push everything away and clean my surface a little. Get rid of this. Make sure I have a clean surface to work on. And what we can look at next is this flour and water pasta dough. So the semolina and water. The southern style pasta dough, if you will, okay? So I have that guy right there that's sweated a little bit. Just to illustrate my point, you guys will notice, right, it's a little lighter in color where it's beginning to sweat. So this can over rest a bit. This is only rested for about an hour, all right? But it is a humid day. So I'm gonna use my bench scraper and just cut a little piece off of there. And I'm going to save, of course, the rest in my bag so it doesn't dry out. And this style of dough will dry very quickly. So keep that in mind as well. Now, once I have a little sliver of dough, and I cut a sliver like this, because again, I want something at first that is conducive to the finished shape. So I'm gonna roll this into a rope, and this is, you know, best suited for that. So. I'm gonna use my whole hand and just kind of work it. Now, while Luca is doing that, uh, Elaine is gonna be handing out the pasta quiz. So ah, take a okay. look at it, mark your answers, and then we're gonna let you know if you got it right or wrong. And whoever got them all right is gonna win a prize. If someone persuades me, we can split the prize, all right? I'm just saying, yeah. okay? All right, so I have something like this, like a rope of dough. And I'm gonna make this quick. I don't wanna take up too much of your time. I'm gonna use my bench scraper or a sharp knife. I just cut pieces from this as long as they are wide. So little square nuggets of dough, if you will. All right. Now, once I have these, there's a myriad of different pasta shapes I can make from just this. So if I take a gnocchi board or anything with ridges, really, uh, to impart texture, I can take that dough and simply roll off of it, making something that looks very familiar to like maybe some gnocchi or something like that. This is like a cavatello, okay? Or gnocchetto sardo, so it has that nice groove and then the rigue, or the ridges, okay, to collect sauce, and it kind of changes the mouthfeel when you have ridges like that, can okay? You, can you do one again? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Easy enough, right? If I do that on a flat surface, like I don't have a gnocchi board, we can make cavatelli very easily, like this, okay, nice and smooth. So the smoothness is just a difference of opinion. When you go to buy dry pasta, there's always two kinds of penne, liche, smooth, and rigate, ridged. Okay, so it's all about personal preferences. The other thing I can do, I'm going to show you guys real quick, it'll be the last thing I do, I promise, is we're going to make some orecchiette with this. Okay, so if I use my knife, I can make an orecchietta. That was a little tricky, I'm sorry, I did that all too fast, right? Okay. All right, all right, okay, okay, hold on. So that's a fancy technique to make these where we just use the knife. I'm not going to show you this, that's a little tricky right there. Okay, but easier technique is you can use a table knife or even like a butter knife, anything. Uh, and basically just drag the dough with the knife, if you guys can see this, drag, 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 all the way through, as if to make a cavatello, like that. And then once we have this, we can actually just unfurl this, turning it inside out over our thumb to make the orecchetta. Okay, so it's just that easy. The fancy way is doing it without that process and just kind of like, you know, shaping it as I go with the knife, okay? Which is how I made these orecchette, which are still going uneaten, guys, by the way. It's over to home, okay? And, uh, and that's the flour and water dough. And I just want to thank you guys. That's pretty much the end of my thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. We can definitely talk about it. Oh, guys, thank you again. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope you learned something. I really appreciate it. And I'm here for questions, OK? Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And my sous chef. And my sous chef, too. <laughs>